inside. 25 now. We are 30. Let's wait a couple of, of seconds more and I will take benefit of these seconds before we start with the event of today to welcome everyone and to explain a little bit about the technical part and also to introduce a little bit uh, the webinar of today that is quite special because it's not just an in-depth event, it's also a DSC webinar event. Then welcome to all the people that is not familiar with, uh, with uh, or topic of dust, but uh, today uh, there will be another webinar related with the dust impact in a specific socioeconomic sector. And Estelios, that is part of the core group of INDAS, uh, will introduce our speaker. And I'm going to introduce you a little bit the platform. Uh, this is a webinar platform, then you as a participant has different ways to contact us and to be uh, express your questions and your comments. These bottoms are related are in the bottom part and is the Q and A that is the questions and answers box. You can type your questions every moment in any moment of the webinar. And Estelios and me, we will uh, launch all the questions at the end of the webinar to all the speaker and. Uh, and also, you can please, you don't wait until the end. You can type your questions in any moment of the event. And then you don't hesitate to, to use it. And also, you have the chat box where you can express comments to the rest of to the panelists. That is basically Estelios, Barbara, and me today. And uh, with this introduction, also, I want to briefly this, uh, introduce Indust. Indust is a community of of a very broad, uh, different uh, type of users and data providers and scientists. And we are trying to be in touch and to promote the use of the dust information for specific sectors. And this is the main motivation to this series of webinars to raise the, the problems related with the sun and the storms and to create some interest in the community and also in the society. And I'm glad to say that I'm the chair of this cost action called the Dust, and all the information is in the website. And also I want to re remember you that all the webinars are recorded and are available after a few days in our website that is costlineindust.eu uh, and everything is uh, accessible through the website. And with this brief introduction, I will pass the role to Estelios uh, Casaxis, that is the responsible of the dissemination and, and capacity building strategy inside this INDAST uh, network. And uh, Estelios, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, in INDAST, we, today we're very happy to, and I'm very happy to introduce to you uh, Barbara Serlin Pearson that uh, she's going to speak about dust impacts on aviation, which is a subject that we talked for uh, three and a half years now in the INDUST community and the INDUST meetings. Uh, Barbara is, is, is uh, working in Austria. In 2010, she got her PhD in natural sciences from the Institute of Physics, University of Graz in Austria in the field of atmospheric remote sensing with radio oscillation data and the use of this data for climate monitoring. And her focus was in upper troposphere, low stratosphere, and from improved understanding of uh, atmospheric dynamics. After that, she has done uh, her postdoc in the University of Graz and also in NCAR at Colorado, USA. And since 2016, she is a scientist in uh, the Central Institute for Meteorology and Geodynamics in Austria in the Chemical Weather Forecast section. So, Barbara, uh, the floor is yours, and thank you very much for accepting the industry invitation. <laughs> thank you, Stelios, for introducing me and, and, and the talk. 
So hello everybody. Um, as as Stelio already mentioned, I work at the um, Austrian Metrological Service, and this is this is important also for this talk because I would like to to mention that I'm not an expert on aviation hazards, and I'm not an engineer, but I work at a metrological service. So. I, I know quite a lot about dust impacts on aviation so far, but um, I did not study it um, from the very beginning. Did quite some literature research, and I will give you an overview on, on all these different topics, which are very, very specific and, and very interesting as well. I would like to start with a, with a personal story, which, which happened in, in 2010. I was on vacation in 2010 in April in, in Portugal, together with my family. Um, we were in Lisbon, walked a lot around, did quite some sightseeing, enjoyed very nice weather, very good food, and enjoyed life in general. Um, we did not watch TV. We did not look at the internet at that time. We only went to restaurants, did sightseeing, and enjoyed life. And on one of these days, we just recognized a lot of people standing in front of a travel agency. So I did not take this picture. This picture is from a different place, but it looked exactly that way. So there was a travel agency and there were lots of people standing in front of this travel agency. And we were wondering what is going on? Why are there so many people standing in front of this um, travel agency? And that's when we turned on the TV and looked at, at the internet and realized, oh, okay, there is a volcanic eruption going on and the Eyjafjallajökull, a volcano in Iceland, erupted a couple of day, uh, days earlier. Um, we heard about this incident three days after the eruption. So it was on April 17th when we heard about this eruption, when we actually saw these people standing in front of this um, travel agency. And we, what we learned from the news was, is okay, there was increasing volcanic activities um, on the Eyjafjallajökull volcano. There were explosive eruption and there was a lot of fine ash injected into the air. We also learned that this ash was advected towards continental Europe and that there were already major disruptions in air traffic. So since the eruption already happened on April 14, and we only learned about it on April 17, it was clear that um, there was already a lot of there were already a lot of things going on, and um, and the, the air traffic, of course, was was a big issue. We then um, looked at the internet and had a look at other possibilities to go home to Austria because our, our flight was scheduled originally um, a day later, so on April 18. Um, and we found out, okay, so if the airspace is closed and if we have to take a public transportation, it is a really long way to go from Portugal to Austria. So um, without any, any break, so if we just, take different different buses and trains and different kinds of um, public transportation. It takes at least 43 hours from Lisbon to Austria. So this is how, uh, when you realize, OK, it's just a very short flight. Um, if you take a short flight, it would take much, much longer if you would take ground based transportation in general. How was the situation um, the, on uh, in flight? So the on on um, in airspace. So this this figure shows um, flight traffic on the 16th of April 2010. You see hardly any um, airplanes flying all over Europe. Um, just a day later, on April 17th, that's, uh, that's when we learned about this volcanic eruption. You see that there are some flights. Um, coming to Portugal, and you see some individual flights here and there, but in general there were no no so air traffic was closed all over Europe on this on this day. It got a bit, little bit better on the 18th um, of April, 
This was the situation on the 19th of April, on the 20th of April, and on the 21st of April. And still, even on the 21st of April, you see the closure of the airspace in large parts of France and also in large parts of, of, of Spain. So we were really, really lucky because actually we went to the airport because we didn't know what to do. So we decided not to take any, any ground-based public transport. And, and even if we would have taken it, we, it was really hard to get, get a seat on a train, for example. So we went to the air um, um, port on, on the uh, 18th. Um, of April and we just waited and talked to the people um, at the airport and we finally caught a flight from Lisbon to Munich, which arrived in Munich around midnight that day. Munich airport was completely empty, so I've never been at an airport where nobody else was there, so I think we were the only people arriving at this airport at, at, at this day. Um, a lot of people laying, lying everywhere. So we got some food, we got some water, we got a bed at the airport and uh, got on another train from Munich um, back home to Graz on the next day on, the, on April 19th. So we were really, really lucky because otherwise we would have waited for additional couple of days. So this eruption of the EF Jala Jökull a volcano was in general a small eruption, but, and this was the very special thing, um, it spread um, very, very fine ash into the air. And this fine ash um, spread unusually far and stayed very long time in the atmosphere. So that's why airspace was affected for such a long day, not only one day or two days, but a couple of days. Um, the economic impact was huge. More than 100,000 flights were canceled um, during this six day period. Uh, seven millions of passengers were affected. So I was one of them. Um, and it was a 1.7 billion US dollars loss in revenue to airlines. So until Corona, it was the largest air, air traffic disruption since uh, the Second World War. So now after Corona, I'm not so sure anymore if the economic impact of the Corona crisis is larger than the uh, impact of the crisis uh, due to the AF Yala Yökul volcano. But so at least from these numbers, you can already recognize that um, the impact was huge. Not only um, aerosols from volcanic eruptions cause problems in aviation, but also other types of aerosols, um, such as dust or aerosols from wildfires. Here you see a picture um, of, of aerosol concentration of smoke, uh, sea salt and dust during October 2017. So this is the situation on, um, I think, the 15th of October. And you see here a white dot, which is called Ophelia. Ophelia was a hurricane. So it is um, after, after it was a hurricane, it was the remaining hurricane, which traveled um, from, from the Atlantic Ocean towards uh, Europe and brought a lot of dust from the Saharan desert towards Europe. At the very same time, and you see it in, in these white colors, there were um, wildfires going on in Portugal and Spain. And this combination of smoke and dust also caused a lot of uh, problems in the air traffic. So just a couple of hours later here, this um, aerosol concentration was, or this aerosol load was brought uh, to the United uh, Kingdom. And um, this was more or less at the end of the situation um, where Ophelia was, 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 was located here. Um, the wildfires um, in Portugal and Spain already started in September 20. Um, you saw that um, there was a peak of the wildfires in mid-October with more than 7,900 forest fires um, in, in, in mid-October 2017. And the 
wind speed, the strong wind from the south, which was associated with the hurricane Ophelia, brought Saharan dust um, towards the north. There were several airplanes affected during this period. So there were reports and on smoke smells on several flights. A number of flights um, has been forced to land or, or at least divert. And also there were precautionary landings following reports of smells in the cockpits because nobody knew if there was smoke in the airplane or if the smoke came from outside. And they only learned that the smoke they smelt on the airplane was associated or the origin that was originated from the wildfires um, on ground and it, it did not or it would not have affected um, the airplanes if this would have been known. Um, so you see, it's not only volcanic ash, it's also wildfires, it's also dust which affects aviation. Um, the focus here in this talk will be on dust, even though I will at some points at least also mention uh, volcanic impacts um, as well. Uh, what is the difference between volcanic eruptions and dust? So I think it is clear if you think about volcanic eruption, uh, they are rare, they have an episodic character, and you don't know at least not far in advance if, if and when a volcanic eruption will happen. So they are more or less unpredictable. Um, dust emissions, on the other hand, are well known, or at least very, quite well known. It is con a continuous process, which has seasonal features. It depends on the condition of the soil, um, but not only on soil, of course, also on meteorological conditions like, like wind or humidity, for example. And due to these well-known um, soil characteristics and also due to the um, 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 possibility of, of modeling meteorological conditions also in advance, it is possible to predict dust storms. Nevertheless, um, volcanic ash and dust have some different physical and chemical characteristics. And these differences in physical and chemical characteristics are important also for implications on aviation, as we will see later on. Um, the impact on aviation for a volcanic eruptions is mainly at cruise levels. Not only, it's not only associated to cruise levels. If there is a volcanic eruption very close to an airport, of course, this airport will be affected as well. Um, and the airport of dust on aviation is mainly at the airport. Again, if the dust storm is close to the airport, it's very, uh, the impact is large, mainly during takeoff and landing, but not only. So we will see later on that there also were some um, incidents happening where, where aviation um, or, or for flights at cruise levels as well. Um, Bedok et al. Uh, did a study where they looked at air traffic incidents reports in Australia. They um, had a look at data from um, 16, 1969 to 2010. Um, I, I think this is a very interesting um, study because it also shows some here, um, historical, or it gives some histor historical view um, on this topic in general. Um, they found 61 incidents which were related to uh, dust in some kind. Important to note is um, that um, it does not give a full idea about all dust related impact because um, the data they checked um, only um, considered um, active uh, air operations. So if a flight was delayed or canceled, but it was, if, if it was delayed, um, and there was no incident during the flight, it would not be considered in the statistics. And it, it was, if it was canceled at all, also it would not uh, have been considered because it didn't go into this um, database. Um, only very few of these incidents uh, caused damaging causing um, um, accidents. And if you look at this graph, which so shows the number of incidents um, over time, you realize that there are a lot of incidents before 1975, essentially. Then there is some more 
incidents between 1975 and 1990 or 1995. And then during the last 15 years of this record, there were only three incidents um, happening. Um, at the same time, this gray line shows uh, the dust storm index, um, which they calculated. And you see um, some wiggles here and there. In general, you see increasing um, dust uh, activity in Australia, especially from 1980 onwards. You see some, some peaks. Here, for example, in uh, 1970, which is associated with a lot of um, air incidents, you see another peak here in 1983, where you also see a higher number of incidents. And finally, you see this peak here in um, 1994, uh, where you also see this that this peak in dust um, activity is, is related to a pretty small peak in, in, in the number of incidents. Um, you also see here, for example, two years, um, 74 and 75, where there was no incident at all. This was related to a La Nina um, episode where, where air is, is more humid in Australia in general. So um, these peaks in, in incidents and also the dust load um, have some, some common features. But as mentioned before, um, most incidents before in the early record of this, um, this study. Um, what kind of categories did they look at or did, did they identify? So why did it um, affect um, the, the, the air transportation? So they found that more than 50% of the effects were associated with navigation. So this includes diversion or return or, or that the, the airplane was not able to, to reach the final destination or also that the airplane was not even possible to, 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 um, to identify its position. So these were these 57% in navigation, um, almost 10% in communication, um, um, 5% some damage related um, problems, 23% in visibility. Visibility is, is, is an important aspect in, in, in these studies in general, and approximately 5% um, where it was miscellaneous um, reasons and they didn't fit into any of these categories. Um, the authors tried to understand why the number of incidents dramatically decreased over time and why there were so many incidents before 1975 or at least before 1990. And they found that it's mainly associated to, um, to navigation um, and communication. So the first two categories um, for the navigation. So in 1990 or since 1990, almost all aircraft um, have a GPS unit on board. So the navigation and positioning is way easier than it was before. And um, this, this was uh, the first reason. And the second reason is improved communication. So um, all the high frequency radio um, um, or after using high frequency radio signals for communication, the systems were replaced with a very high frequency radio system and this significantly improved communication. And, and um, so that's why communication was not an issue anymore. I think the last report about uh, communication based problem due to dust was related in 1997 or so. So all the communication, um, these 9.8 percent um, all happened before 1979. So technological advancements are were really, really important. Um, of course, it was also that the number of reports uh, could be uh, um, uh, small, smaller now compared to other due, due to communication systems and things like that. But I think the, the technological advances um, clearly um, 
can explain a lot of this uh, decrease in the um, reported incidents in Australia. There are still um, fatal aircraft crash crashes. So um, just to name a few, so Middleton 2017 gave a list of four um, fatal aircraft crashes um, after 20, uh, 20, uh, 2000. So there was one incident um, in, in Cote d'Ivoire in, in early or late January 2000 um, with, with almost 180 um, dead. There was another incident in May um, 22 with 18 people uh, died in Tunisia. Um, then there were two incidents in 2011 and in, in 2012. This figure on the right uh, shows um, the, the air ambulance in India, which crashed into uh, the neighborhood in, in India and caused seven people dying on board of this air ambulance and three people were died um, on ground. So, and all these incidents um, were at least somehow related to dust and of course wind in the atmosphere since dust and wind often uh, come together. Um, what is the problem with, with visibility? So visibility is a problem in particular during takeoff and landing um, at the airport. And it is of course often associated with strong winds. So from this relationship here, you see uh, the relationship between dust concentration and visibility. And you see the higher the dust concentration, the lower the visibility. And this is exactly the problem um, which is encountered um, also for aviation. Um, this plot on the right uh, shows um, visibility conditions and um, also um, me the meteorological situation which is aerodrome specific in, in some regard. Important are these two numbers down here. If the visibility is smaller than 400 meters, RVR um, is the runway visibility range. Um, if it is smaller than 400 meter, if the runway visibility range is lower than 75 um, meters, very special. Uh, low visibility procedures have to uh, be performed. So um, dependent on the visibility range, there are different visibility conditions, which range from visibility condition one to um, visibility condition four. And there are different um, problems for the um, air traffic control and also for the pilot. So for the air traffic control, they control the airdrome ground uh, traffic visually, which is only possible during uh, conditions, visibility condition one. So if it's more or less like normal, um, if there is reduced visibility, the air traffic controller cannot really uh, see everything from the place uh, where he or she is. So the air traffic controller is unable to control some or all, it depends on the visibility range, of course, of the maneuvering um, area visually. For the pilot, um, taxis and um, uh, um, avoid. So the pilot is in the airplane, so visibility affects the pilot a little bit later than the air traffic controller. Um, but there are also conditions if the visibility is lower than 400 meters where the pilot is not able uh, to avoid other air traffic visually, um, or even if the visibility is very low, so lower than 75 meters, where the pilot is unable to taxi visually, even on ground. So depending on the visibility conditions, there are different visibility procedures, which are defined by, um, by, by, by the ICAO. Um, you can read everything in this in this document. This is a really comprehensive document about different uh, visibility procedures. Um, the main goal of these visibility procedures is to ensure safe operations. What is the problem with visibility? Of course, uh, significant delays 
due to this or at least associated with the low visibility procedures. If it's not possible to land at a specific airport, rerouting might be possible. Flight cancellation, if a flight is supposed to depart from the specific airport. And of course, there are disturbances in airport operation um, for the ground staff. And also, you have to remove the dust um, from, from runways, for example, or from, from other critical areas. There was a study from Arkeda and Arkandari in 2020, a very recent one, who had a look at arrival, scheduled arrival and actual arrival and departure times uh, during dust storms in Kuwait International Airport. And of course, it, it makes sense, of course, that they found large differences between scheduled flights and arrival um, flights, so scheduled and arrival. Uh, actual arrival times and departure times uh, during dust storms compared to regular conditions. As a very uh, specific uh, event um, is brownout, which is also associated with visibility. It mainly affects helicopters, not so much um, airplanes, more helicopters. And it means that there is a visibility restriction due to sand and dust um, during landing or during uh, departure. It's often associated with the helicopter rotor downwash. Um, of course, depends on the soil composition and of the wind. And it, it caused uh, quite some accidents, um, especially during takeoff and landing. And, and military helicopters were often affected for example, during operation in, in Afghanistan or Iraq. Uh, another problem is, of course, associated with wind. Dust devils can happen. So dust devils have, are characterized by sudden changes in wind speed and direction, and they can also have uh, reduced visibility. Um, there was a, a study of Lorenz and, and Myers who had a look at um, air accident reports um, also for this 10-year uh, period. They had identified almost 100 um, um, incidents, also several fatal incidents. But in general, it was not clear if it was more uh, the wind speed being the problem or the dust being the problem. Um, it's probably more the dust, uh, the wind speed, sorry, the, it's more the wind speed um, than the dust, which actually caused the problems. And um, they found uh, that, so in, in, in general, dust devils are, are a hazard for light um, aviation. So more like balloons and helicopters and gliders and not big commercial aircraft. Another problem, I only want to mention it um, uh, very shortly, is electrostatic charging. So um, electrostatic charging due to mineral dust was shown to be of have to have the same importance as electrostatic charging from other sources, such as raindrops, uh, snowflakes, um, and things like that. Um, the problem is that there can, uh, they can induce noise in radio communications of the aircraft. There can be a problem for ground personnel or during operations, for example, refueling. Um, and if the electronic devices are not well protected, they can also lead to problems um, on these onboard electronic devices. So at least I think it's not of main, main focus um, of this talk, but it should not be forgotten that electrostatic charging of mineral dust can also cause some problems. Um, interesting is the blockage of the pitot tube. The pitot tube um, is shown here on this figure here on the right. These are two pitot tubes, which actually press, uh, measure pressure, and this pressure is converted to airspeed. And if this um, pitot tube is blocked, um, it, uh, the pilot gets information about wrong um, airspeed. Mm -hmm. And there were already several fatal accidents associated with um, the blockage of the pitot tube um, in airplanes. Uh, the pitot tube blocking can be caused by ice. It can be caused by volcanic ash, sands, and even insects can um, cause the blocking of this pitot tubes. 
an interesting study of uh, Nitschkov, uh, which was published this year, was about uh, the, um, the, the role of dust for ice nucleation for two um, aircraft incidents, one aircraft uh, accident of the Air France flight um, in 2019, where an aircraft crashed into the tropical Atlantic Ocean. And uh, the investigation report shows that the pitot tubes actually were iced. Um, Nitschko and his colleagues, they looked at different satellites measurements, did some uh, dust, combined dust and meteorological modeling. Um, it is well known that, that mineral dust particles are efficient ice nuclei, and, and they found that desert dust might have played an important role to, um, to, to create these um, ice particles because mineral dust um, formed as ice nuclei and, and these ice nuclei were finally um, associated with the icing of the pitot tubes. A similar incident um, occurred in 2014 um, over Africa, where also an engine pressure ratio became erroneous, also because of instrument icing. And in this study, um, the authors also showed that dust may, might have played an important role also for icing um, of this instrument, and which, which caused the fatal accident in 2014. Um, I now want to say something about uh, the engine um, of an aircraft. So this is how an engine looks like. The air comes from the left. At the very first uh, part of the engine, you have an internal particle separator, which basically filters dust particles or, or all kinds of particles. It removes large particles from the engines. Uh, the next part um, of an engine is the compressor. And in the compressor, there are, for example, uh, compressor plates. And since uh, the particle separator does not remove all particles, but only larger ones, so particles smaller than about 10 microns can pass this particle uh, filter. Some particles get into the compressor and cause erosion of the compressor blades. It is because of the high hardness of atmospheric dust. Um, it comes to friction and surface damages, gap, gap, uh, gap size augmentation, which can be shown here as well between individual um, blades. And this, of course, leads to uh, flow deterioration and to a gradual loss of the engine performance. And it affects um, engine efficiency and the compression stability. Um, after the compression, there is the combustion and the high pressure turbine. And this is where uh, the highest temperatures are reached inside of this um, turbine with, with uh, we will see later about these uh, temperatures. Um, this is the hot area of the engine and glass can deposit in this um, part of the engine with rough surface. So the problem is that it, there is a rapid loss of performance by disturbing the flow field. It is a potential risk for, for uh, during takeoff and landing. And these deposits can lead to thermal corrosion to an engine component and uh, to blocking the cooling holes, which again can lead to huge problems of the engine um, of the aircraft. Um, In-flight flame out, this glass deposit also mentioned earlier can lead to turbine blade stall and to uh, an extinction of the flame in the combustion chamber, which basically means that the engine doesn't work anymore and it just stopped. There were two um, aircraft um, affected in the late 1980s or in the 1980s, where there was a flame out of all engines after flying through volcanic ash. And I think these were these incidents uh, were the ones which which brought into attention uh, the problem of volcanic ash for aviation. And it's not only volcanic ash, but also dust, um, which can make these kind of problems. So this plot shows melting point temperatures of different uh, dust components and current engines, as shown earlier, operate approximately at 
1,500 uh, 1, this is given in degrees Celsius so at another 270 degrees to have it in, in Kelvin um, um, and future engines will operate at even higher temperatures and at these higher temperatures also quartz um, will, will become melted and quartz is a, an important component of dust so it is an increasing problem or dust melting will be an increasing problem in aviation especially due to these uh, future engines operating at higher temperatures. The problem is also that um, dust composition is different on the earth so different flights will be affected differently um, because in some uh, parts of the world quartz is the dominating um, um, component in other kinds of the world there are other components which are more important so it is a it is a regional feature which has to be taken account into account when looking at these uh, problems. It is an issue for maintenance costs in the very first order. Um, if we, we calculated uh, the dust load for different flights and found um, here one flight which was very, very uh, we're very, we found very high dust load uh, for this particular flight due to um, the dust concentration. It was a flight from Paris to Chennai in India. Um, and if you calculate the maintenance costs, you will find that um, just for this one single flight on this day can cause a loss of up to 5,000 euros, which is a lot of money, of course. Um, if you look on a, uh, the, how much ash or dust is needed to damage the aircraft um, gas turbine, you will find uh, this, this chart, which is a duration of exposure versus ash and sand, sand dust concentration um, map, where you see, for example, um, the green colors incidate that show that there is practically negligible damage, the yellow ones have long-term damage, orange colors means there is an exigent damage, that means that it is immediate, there has to be some, something done immediately, but it did not have any safety implications, and the safety implications are shown in red. Um, there are 25 uh, cases analyzed um, and also lo always looked at the, the duration of the engine exposure and, um, and the um, dust concentration, which was um, um, found for this for this incident or test, there were also test cases. Um, what you basically see, the current, um, at least for volcanic ash, there is they agreed on a number of two milligrams per cubic meter. So this is the safe to fly zone. If ash concentration is lower than two milligrams per cubic meter, um, and actually you can fly. Uh, for almost an hour in, two, um, and in this two milligrams per cubic meter um, concentration until a possible uh, safety implication, if there is a possible safety implication, you can fly even longer if, there is, if it is for sure. So this kind of uh, charts can be used to get a better idea about how long you can fly through uh, air with a specific ash concentration until you will encounter significant damage. So this is the summary. Um, dust impact uh, on aviation, I showed that there is reduced um, visibility, um, which is often associated with strong winds. I mentioned electrostatic charging, even though it might not be the highest uh, or biggest problem in aviation associated with dust. Icing is a, a significant problem as shown, was shown by, by Nitschko and his colleagues um, because, because um, of the ice nucleation uh, of, of, of dust or the, the um, creating ice nucleation and these ice nucleations can, for example, block um, pitot tubes and the mechanical problems, erosion, not only in, in the engine, but also in the rest of the, um, the aircraft, corrosion, blocking of cooling holes, 
the engine flame out in flight um, and the blockage of the pitot tube um, also um, not only due to ice uh, particles, but also due to dust. So I, I also have some slides left um, which deal or show some, some, some um, general overview about our Unetix AV product, but I on only will show you the very first one to introduce the project. Um, this was a Horizon 2020 project, um, which was uh, worked on from 2016 to 2019. And we had a look at four different kinds of hazards. We looked mainly looked at volcanic eruptions, um, explosions from nuclear power plants, but also dust storms and forest fires. Um, the thing these hazards have in common is that they are rare events that there is a high uncertainty in source terms. Um, the sensitivity of dispersion models to the source term is, is of particular interest. Um, the availability and variety of observation and, and the key products. So what are the key products um, potential stakeholders are interested in? And this is what we addressed in this um, project, project, but I do not want to go into detail now because I think, I think um, the main topic of this talk was about um, the impact of dust on aviation, and I think that's all I have. Thank you very much, Barbara. Thank you uh, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, we have a question in the chat, Stelios. <laughs> Yeah, as yes, we don't have too many questions, but there is a question about, uh, uh, well, if plane companies uh, have some ways to use this dust forecast in order to, uh, let's say, have an optimal, uh, optimize their route and minimize the chances of uh, this kind of uh, failures. Do you know something about that? Are I, I, actually I, the companies taking into account this? I know that there are some studies going on which exactly um, do this kind of, of investigation. So in Unetics, in Unetics was a non-operational product uh, project, <laughs> so we did not uh, do any operational stuff, but we did some case studies and we also had um, air traffic management people on board. So we looked, for example, for volcanic eruptions. We, we made an artificial eruption of the Etna volcano. And, and together with the people from the air traffic management, we tried to find out or to optimize the flight routes um, to, to reduce uh, the, the damage to the engines and also, to, of course, to ensure safe um, flight operation. So there are some 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 research uh, projects going on. I also know that that Royce Royce, for example, uh, did some studies with with, uh, with with CAMS data. So CAMS data are, for example, used for this purpose. CAMS free analysis um, to get a better idea about the global dust distribution and to get a better idea about the impact of dust and also other aerosols such as sea salt, for example. Um, on the on the engines, so I don't know. I don't think that it is operationally used currently, but at least there are some activities going on to to get closer um, to to also to the industry partners. That it's not only an academic topic, but it it gets more relevant also for the industry. Also, it is asking if uh, what measures do you propose to remedy the inconvenience of dust and go inside the engines? What measures? Yeah. Oh, what, what, what do you mean with measures? I think that is for engineers and manufacturers, the questions, but uh, this question, but yeah. It is asking if you, if you have an idea of any measure that can I think what is important reduce is, the impact is, 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 is um, dust <coughs> size and dust con uh, composition. I think these two um, measures are most important because it depends on the dust size. 
if it is filtered um, by the particle filter or it guests or if it guests into uh, um, the compressor and the combustion um, and it the, the dust composition is of high importance because because of the melting temperature so if if the dust um, is composed of of, of um, particles with low melting temperatures they get can be accumulated and can block these cooling holes, for example, which is a major issue and which finally um, can cause this inflate flight flame out. So dust with low um, melting temperatures has similar characteristics to volcanic ash and this uh, flame out is a seriously known uh, problem. So I think it's mainly dust size and dust composition in my opinion. Okay, uh, there is another question in the chat and uh, we ask about your statement on the one kilogram of dust that results uh, in approximately 50 to 100 kilo euro of cost and uh, asking where does this number come from? Is it some source or? I, I don't have a, a reference, it's a personal communication, so. <laughs> It's it's an okay. assumption. So it's it's an assumption which is based on a personal communication with an, an engineer. Okay. Uh, there is no more questions, but I have one for you. If you can let me share my screen, Barbara. Mm -hmm. I want to put in your list uh, an event that uh, in fact I don't know if Natalia is today in the in the room, but there were a very extreme event in Canary Islands in February last year, in 2020. And the, the group of Ritania were doing uh, an estimation of the cost. And uh, this will be the event. It was the most extreme event in a time series of more than 20 years. And it was like over 700 cancellation flights because it was during the winter break of the Scandinavian countries that are used to go to Canary Island for the winter time. And then they estimate lost around 17 million euros based on euro control uh, estimation cost about cancellations and everything. And just for your info, if you want to put in your, mm -hmm. in your you. list. <laughs> it was nice, Su super nice talk. Thanks a lot, Barbara, for this nice overview. Mm -hmm. yes. I don't know if there is any other question in the room, Estelios. No. Uh, just, uh, yeah, just a comment from my side. I wanted to, it's maybe a naive comment, but still. Uh, we're talking about dust and the effects on the aviation and uh, always we saw these uh, dust related maps and there are areas of course that uh, the possibility of uh, having dust entering the planes is much more but I think one very important aspect is the actual height of the of the plume because even if uh, you have this let's say long flights that even passing, uh, from the Sahara and maybe they are, they are probably too high to, to have this dust uh, problems and there are other flights that are more or less uh, landing in the proximity of dust areas which is much more uh, let's say dangerous so someone for sure would like to have this kind of height and to try to categorize this kind of uh, let's say possibility of having these effects in terms of actual, uh, let's say, landing areas or flight uh, heights of the, of the planes. So it's, I think it's more complex in terms of uh, uh, two-dimensional uh, map. Yeah. But uh, I guess this is just more than a comment, not a question. <laughs> no, I completely agree. But but if you think about these icing incidents, for example, they these incidents, these accidents happened at, at cruise levels. So it was the yeah. indirect effect of dust, but it was okay. associated with dust. So um, I think it is important to, 
to account for the vertical. Um, it is, of course, important to account for the vertical distribution of dust. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we calculated for, for the UNETICS project, we calculated everything on, on 13 flight levels. So we had yeah. these dedicated products, and one of them was, um, was three dimensional distribution of dust. And this was the model output, of course, on 13 flight levels. Um, up to flight level 650, which might be too high, high or, or practically not relevant, at least not everywhere, but, but it is important to, to look at the vertical distribution and for aviation purposes to calculate everything on flight levels and not in height or pressure. There is yeah. still some comments in the chat. Uh, this is about the previous question that Asterius launched to you is if is is asking specifically if there is any kind of uh, a study or analysis that analyze what's happened when the dust is inside the engine because there are some reports from flights uh, some of them from military sector mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that uh, reports that the engine stopped Mm -hmm. and then restarted after mm -hmm. the, they passed the dust cloud. This is exactly what this engine flame out means. So it means that the flame inside of the um, combustion gets out and the, the engine doesn't work anymore. This happened for these two mentioned flights which flew through Vokeni Gash. Um, and but but fortunately these aircraft were, were or the pilots were able to restart the engines and safely um, arrived at it some 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 airport. So yes, dust can dust and ash can uh, come into the airport and and affect the engine inside as well through. I think I mentioned erosion, the erosion of the um, combustion blades or corrosion or um, aggregation of, of dust. And this aggregation is exactly the problem if it melts and, and gets into uh, the compressor where, where it's really hot. So, and, and then it can cool, uh, block some cooling holes and then you get into these troubles. And the last question from Eve is, do you have any historical time series of the occurrence of this type of incidents with the blocking of the, the, the engine? Or is there any database where you, you can track how frequently is this happening? Mm -hmm. I think it's not so frequent anymore because of these uh, regulations, because um, uh, the international community agreed on, on not flying through regions with an ash concentration higher than two milligrams per cubic meter. Um, you also have um, volcanic ash advisory centers around the world. So all the airspace is covered at least by one of these volcanic ash advisory centers. And they um, model volcanic eruptions. They, uh, get the, they are in charge of warning um, pilots and, and airlines and everybody um, associated um, about and, and inform people about volcanic eruptions, um, do the modeling, have an idea about the volcanic ash concentration and, and say, identify non to fly areas. So um, I, think, I think these incidents are not so common anymore. Um, I don't have a database to, to answer this question <laughs> specifically. <Yeah. laughs> I know about these two um, events. Um, you have to do some literature research to find out. I guess there are more, but, but these two are the most well-known incidents. Okay, thank you. Maybe one last question before, because we are very close to four o'clock. If you know if someone ever defined concentration thresholds for dust, like there is for volcanic acids, different properties probably imply different effect on aviation for the same concentration level. So the question is if you uh, some if you know someone that ever defined this kind of concentration thresholds. If if you look at this um, duration of exposure versus ash concentration chart I showed, so where you have. Um, dust exposure on the y-axis and dust concentration on the x-axis, there are some 
does events include it? So it does not only include um, volcanic ash, but it also includes dust. Um, so of course there are some common uh, problems between dust and, and volcanic ash. Um, the main difference is the composition, but, but in terms of exposure and concentration, um, you find some, some common um, characteristics and, and uh, Rory Clarkson did a very detailed study on this. So look at the Clarkson and Simpson 2017 study and you fi will find um, differences and similarities between ash and dust. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Barbara, for your uh, very nice presentation, which is really, I think, very closely related with the uh, in-dust uh, objectives. And uh, just uh, the last thing, I think, for it's Sarah, to announce yeah. the next uh, seminar. Or next seminar, it will be the last one before the summer break. And it is one webinar that was uh, scheduled initially for uh, the end of this month, but at the end we have to cancel. Then Israel is a rescheduled meeting at the 13th June in two weeks, Wednesday as usual, at 3 European time. And the topic is the dust mineralogy and the relation with the climate uh, uh, issues. And our speaker will be Carlos Perez, that I'm glad to say that is my group leader here at BSC. Then it's my pleasure to have his talk in this series of in-dash webinars. And the regist registration is open, then just go to the link in the website and do the registration. And uh, we'll see in two weeks, same hour, same day of the week. And hope that you will have a very nice two weeks. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Barbara. Thank you very much, Barbara, and thank you, everybody, for joining this webinar.